year and representing the uh, wonderful people of Joondala. So I would like to just take a few moments this morning to uh, reflect on uh, the makeup of my electorate and the lo lovely people that I've met and the organisations that I've met. Within Joondalup, which is a, a community that I personally have lived in for uh, the great majority of my life, and indeed my wife and I still live in the heart of it at the moment, we've got some amazing schools. I've got three high schools, uh, two private and uh, one uh, independent public school, being Bellridge Secondary College, all of outstanding calibre. And I've got nine primary schools and three education support centres. Especially with the education support centres, can I just quickly say, for those that don't know, or I dare say many members in here will know, but the education support centres are attached to an existing school and they spe specifically cater for children uh, with disabilities. And indeed, even within my own family, my sister uh, has had need for uh, her first child to go to an education support centre, actually at Junior Primary School. Uh, so within my own family, we've experienced the professionalism and the outstanding level of care and education that these children receive. I think also it's amazing that uh, these education support centres, they are not a separate school, or they, well they are, but they are not in isolation on their own campus, they are actually on the campus of another school and they work very, very closely together. The children interact as often as practical and possible and I believe not only does that benefit the children in the education support centre, but from speaking with the principals uh, of the adjacent schools in my electorate to the education support centres, uh, they tell me of the great benefits that the other children have in, in learning about children with disability, learning acceptance and learning understanding in regard to their interactions. I simply don't have enough time today to go through the list of just amazing teachers and principals and school staff that I've had the great privilege of meeting. To each of the schools that I've visited, they have got some outstanding teachers, passionate teachers, and I must say, highly competent and caring principals. I'm utterly proud to have each and every single one of them in my electorate. Behind all of these schools, of course, you have volunteer organisations such as your uh, PNCs. And uh, I've obviously had the privilege of uh, attending as many of them as I can through, throughout the year. And again, it amazes me to no end the amount of volunteering that goes on in our community mums and dads, and in some instances actually people that don't have any children at all at their school, but just feel it incumbent upon them to volunteer and assist the school in moving forward. So can I just say to all of the members of the PNC organisations in Joondalup, all the mums, the dads and the other people that help out tirelessly, whether it's manning the canteens, the uniform shops, the children's banking, the fundraising, the whole lot, in many instances, these people have full-time jobs. I thank them sincerely, and it's been an absolute privilege getting to know them over the last year. Joondalup is also home to the Joondalup Learning Precinct, which has Edith Cowan University, the West Coast Institute of Training, and also the uh, Western Australian Police Academy in it. And what an outstanding precinct it is. Uh, Edith Cowan University, for the fifth year in a row, has received a five-star rating in the Good Universities Guide for its teaching quality, its generic skills, and overall graduate satisfaction. That is a great accomplishment, and I'm very, very proud on behalf of Edith Cowan University, and I congratulate them on that achievement. The university is also rapidly expanding. We know that there's a huge population growth in the northern suburbs. I believe that ECU is ideally situated to help service that. But not only that, ECU is a very popular university for a growing number of international students, uh, and many of which uh, of interest actually is also from Africa. And we know obviously the Premier has recently travelled to Africa and there's a lot of African students coming to study at ECU. To help accommodate that growth, ECU has uh, invested $72 million in their new, what they're terming, Building 34 project, which will house an enhanced student services facility due to be completed in 2015. 
Uh, concurrently with that, there's also a new 127-bed student development uh, for accommodation being built, which will feature multiple common areas and a swimming pool. And this is in addition to the existing student accommodation options that they have, which is great to see that further development happening in Joondalup. ECU is also home to the Joondalup Pines Outdoor Cinemas, which in 2013 were upgraded with new seating options, picnic space and landscaped areas. It's a great place to go during the Summer Films Festival. Uh, rug up, grab yourself a pizza from Slice of Italy there and uh, uh, watch a great outdoor movie. The West Coast Institute of Training, again, what a fantastic facility. As someone who has come from a training background in the private industry before joining Parliament, uh, I have to say again, outstanding staff, outstanding management, great board. Uh, the managing director, uh, uh, Michelle Hode, does an outstanding job, great staff. The West Coast Institute of Training is actually an award-winning uh, award culinary school. In fact, recently, uh, one of their apprentices got awarded Apprentice uh, of the Year Australia-wide uh, in uh, his culinary school, so huge congratulations there. They also have a state-of-the-art computer animation facility, which would have to be seen to be believed, especially uh, within the 3D area, and a lot of the lecturers there are actually now travelling uh, internationally to uh, share their knowledge of the animation faculty with other countries. Now, I don't want to digress too much, but I couldn't help but uh, be aware of some of the comments that the member for Coburn made yesterday in and around uh, the training area. And I have to say, as someone who equally takes a bit of a keen interest in the training area, I think there was a substantial amount of poetic licence taken uh, in relation to the comments surrounding the uh, funding caps or the fee caps. And so before speaking this morning, I decided to investigate some of those assertions a bit closer. And I think it's only proper that we set some of these uh, statements clear. Now, with some of the comments that were made, I would just uh, uh, say to the member for Coburn that the $400 cap that was mentioned is specifically targeted at school-age students only, who under the school leaving age legislation are required to be engaged in education, training or improved employment. Furthermore, the $2,500 fee cap, which was spoken about, applies to all other students enrolled in a qualification between Certificate 1 and Certificate 4. Now, importantly, the $7,500 fee cap that was discussed is for diploma students, and this is important, is accompanied by access to an income contingent loan that enables them to defer the upfront fees until they are earning above a certain salary threshold, currently over $50,000 a year. In essence, what we're looking at there is similar to a HEX system. Now, when I studied my undergraduate at university, I, at that time, uh, applied to the HEC system. Now, since that time, I've obviously paid that back, but that was the decision that I made to further my education. So that is obviously available for diploma students. Now, the member for Coban also made a couple of comparison uh, of fees for enrolled nursing diplomas. And on that, I should actually say, the West Coast Institute of Training has got a, uh, a simulated hospital ward an outstanding facility which I've had the opportunity to tour and in fact nursing and uh, uh, nursing faculty is quite strong within the West Coast Institute of Training, hence I took a fair bit of interest in the member for Coburn's comments. The 2013 figure of $600 which was quoted by the member of Coburn was a one semester fee only and the diploma of nursing is generally scheduled over three semesters. So to set the record straight a 2013 fee for a complete diploma of nursing would normally have been around $1,800. I'll leave that there, but I just felt, again, simply because of the, uh, the fact that uh, West Coast does do a fair bit of nursing training. Facility to have the, uh, the academy in Joondalup. I've had the opportunity to attend a, a number of graduations, which certainly remind me of my own graduation from the Royal Australian Air Force. It was very similar, I've got to say. Uh, State-of-the-art facility, attracting quite a bit of attention from other states and countries, which is great to see. We've got delegations coming over, having a look at our academy and how we do our training to see if they can emulate that in their state and country. It's got a great simulator room, uh, and you'll be proud to know that I believe I've done us members of parliament quite proud in there, uh, as I uh, took part in a simulation and ended up tasering some poor lady, but apparently it was the right thing to do. 
I got the nod of approval from the instructors of that or they were just being very nice and generous to me. A community isn't complete without community groups. And June Love is certainly no different. We've got some wonderful community groups. And just starting off, I just want to talk about some of our residence associations. Probably one of the longest running and I'd dare say almost most successful residence associations that we have in Joondalup is the Connolly Residence Association. Currently being uh, well looked after by uh, Penny Gilpin and Brian Richardson and, and, and their board as well. We've got very proactive, they get a lot done for their community, uh, they communicate with the community and they've got a great lot of support. I also want to give the Connolly Residence Association uh, credit for making themselves available to offer advice for surrounding suburbs who wanted to go through the process of becoming a re residence association themselves. And most recently, actually, we've had the creation of the Heathridge Residence Association, which was initiated by Karen West. I congratulate her for all of the hard work. I thank Penny and Brian for offering their advice to Karen. And that residence association is now up and running. Uh, and I believe they've got some a great vision for Heathridge, which is a vibrant suburb, which is going through renewal. You've got more and more young families moving in there. And I believe that the Heathridge Residents Association will serve that suburb very, very well. We also have the creation uh, quite recently of the Currambine Residents Association, who I will admit I haven't had the chance to meet up with as yet, but it is on my to-do list. They are a fairly new residents association. I congratulate them for uh, their creation and certainly between the member for Ocean Reef and myself, uh, we will offer them all support possible. Um, one suburb that I'm quite happy to uh, work with in the future, which I believe could also benefit from a residence association that doesn't have one at the moment, is actually the suburb of Joondalup, uh, aptly named after my electorate. And uh, so whilst we don't have a residence association for them, you're very well represented, I would imagine, <laughs> um, I will work with the uh, residents of Joondalup to see whether there's an interest uh, by them to start up a residence association. We also have the Joondalup Men's Shed, which I'm proud to say won the 2014 Premier's Active Citizenship Award. What an outstanding group. My little two-year-old has a little wooden toolbox that I acquired uh, from them, and he absolutely loves that. So well done to the Men's Shed. We also are home to the Spears Centre in Heathridge, an outstanding community group. They offer financial counselling, all manner of support and uh, children's groups. I mean, the list is, is endless. I would almost need the remaining time that I have this morning to tell you of the beneficial services that the Spear Centres provides to the community uh, beyond the boundaries of Heathridge. Uh, so to Rhonda Adamson, uh, her staff, her board, I thank them and uh, just encourage them to keep going with the great work that they're doing as I will continue to support them in any manner that I can. Uh, Joondalup has got some amazing sporting clubs, far too many to go into too much detail here. At a local level, at a waffle level, uh, within basketball, netball, you name it, uh, Joondalup, we're right at the sharp end, I'd like to imagine, with our sporting clubs. Uh, obviously, we are home to the mighty West Perth Football Club, the Falcons, and it would be uh, uh, very wrong of me not to uh, mention and remind everyone that the West Perth Football Club were the 2013 Waffle Premiership winners, so congratulations to them. And also, I just wanted to um, quickly make note that, oh no, it'll be repeated, it'll be repeated, I reckon they'll hold on to that crown for a little while. Now, the, uh, the, the, the West Perth Football Club, together with um, the uh, Ocean Ridge Football Club uh, and, and a, number, a number of other local football uh, clubs, actually um, recently, the Quinns District Football Club, sorry, I'm corrected, came up with um, what they called the Integrated Football Teams. And what an outstanding uh, initiative. For those that don't know, that is actually a football initiative designed for anyone over the age of 16 with an intellectual disability, male or female. They're outstanding, aren't they? And I think, uh, again, between the member of Ocean Reef and myself and, and many other uh, members in the northern suburbs, we're delighted to support that. I take my hat off to the local football clubs for uh, creating these opportunities for greater inclusion uh, and awareness in our community. So it would have been wrong of me not to acknowledge that. Uh, 
first instance and uh, managed to make it down for the first day of that and they had extensive interest. I think they had 20 to 30 uh, players rock up so they can form well a team done. right off the bat. Well done. Yeah, well, well done to the Ocean Bridge Football Club and the support mm. that they have received. Uh, look, moving along, uh, Joondalup Health Campus. I mean, at the heart of uh, the Joondalup uh, Town Centre, we've got this amazing uh, medical facility, uh, certainly one that I'm very proud of, and as are many of the North uh, Metropolitan team. I just wanted to share uh, some key bits of information and statistics with members who may not be fully aware uh, of um, the Joondalup Health Campus. Uh, Joondalup Health Campus is actually Australia's largest public-private partnership hospital proud to have that in Joondalup. We currently have 664 licensed beds, which makes Joondalup Health Campus one of the largest hospitals in Western Australia. I believe we're currently number two after Royal Perth Hospital, and, and we're one of the largest hospitals, and we will remain that. From January to December in two, uh, 2013, emergency presentations at Joondalup Health Campus were 90,818 or 248 per day. That actually makes it one of the busiest emergency departments in Australia. It's quite amazing. The redevelopment that has recently been completed uh, at the Joondalup Health Campus came in under budget and ahead of schedule. I think that's very important to, um, and worthy of mention. Uh, we went from a 380 bed general hospital to a 664 bed sub-tertiary facility. Following $223 million investment by this WA state government, and, it should be ad added, $131 million investment by Ramsey Healthcare. It gave us an expanded level two special care nursery. We've got an additional ward with 85 beds, 12 new operating theatres, a cath lab and a 10 bed coronary care unit, nine bed intensive care and six bed high dependency unit, a new 150 bed private hospital, additional specialist medical centre, a clinical school, pathology and radiology facilities, uh, and the list goes on. This redevelopment, members, is the Reed Report in action. It's expanding our outer metro hospitals to relieve pressure on the major tertiary hospitals while enabling most patients to receive hospital care closer to home. So I'll congratulate uh, the uh, hospital on everything that they're doing, and I know that their expansion is not finished yet. The growth is going to continue in the near future. Uh, Mr Acting Speaker, may I seek an extension, extension please? Extension granted. Thank you. I have to say it's great to see a lot of local development and private investment happening in Joondalup and I believe that that is actually testament uh, not only to Joondalup the area but also the confidence that uh, private investors have uh, in our state and our future. Uh, a couple of examples if I may share with you, we've got the wonderful Joondalup Resort. Now for those that don't know, the Joondalup Resort is ranked WA's number one golf course and actually it's ranked number four in all of Australia by Golf Australia, the governing body. That's quite an uh, achievement. Most recently, Joondalup Resort have invested $12 million in the creation of the new Lakeview Ballroom, an absolutely stunning facility. I thank the Premier for making the time to, to come out and officially open that facility. Uh, the Lakeview Ballroom has a 450 seat capacity, a sorely lacking um, capability prior to this in the northern suburbs, which has now been addressed. And I dare say, from what I've heard, their bookings are already uh, very healthy looking, which doesn't surprise me. And the Joondalup Resort has actually said that their, their next project is to add even more hotel rooms to the resort, uh, which is understandable given the growth uh, in the northern suburbs and also uh, their reputation as an outstanding resort. Lakeside Shopping Centre is undergoing a $300 million redevelopment to become the state's largest shopping centre. By the time that they're completed uh, in the next year or so, uh, we will have a Maya, great addition. I was hoping David Jones might join as well, but I'll, I'll keep working on that. But anyway, I'm happy that we've got Maya and 120 new specialty stores. In total, we're going to have over 90,000 square metres of retail space. So that's a great investment and a great sign of confidence in Joondalup and its surround. And on a side note, can I just say, I really want to congratulate the management of Lakeside Shopping Centre for having the courage in this era of overt political correctness to have a full nativity uh, set on display prior to Christmas. 
at a time when no one's even willing to say Merry Christmas anymore. Everyone has to say Happy Snow. People say Happy Greetings and Festive Seasons and, and Happy Holidays. And, you know, with all the controversy we heard around the world, where the shopping centres weren't able to have a nativity set anymore, I'm quite happy to go on record. Well done, Lakeside June Love Shopping Centre. Well Members. done for having the courage Members. to put a nativity set on there. Members. You did. I tell you, yes, the member for Mandurah didn't uh, members. do it. Now, briefly, I also want to thank the city of Joondalup. I've got to say uh, I've had a great time in the last year working with the CEO, uh, Mr Gary Hunt. Obviously, the mayor, the councillors and the various officers of the city of Joondalup have uh, been very much welcomed by them, and I'm very glad to say that I've got a great working relationship with them, and together we're working on the vision for Joondalup. Speaking of which, the vision for Joondalup we, the vision for Joondalup really is to continue to be the CBD of the northern suburbs. We have amazing growth. We're now calling Yanship a suburb where it once used to be a holiday destination. And in amongst this northern corridor of growth, uh, Joondalup had always been envisioned to be the CBD of that growing area. Now, in many respects, as I've mentioned, with the hospital and the shopping centre and that kind of stuff, we are getting there. But I believe more needs to be done and also believe there is a window of opportunity in which we need to do it. With the recent changes to the town planning uh, regional scheme, there, we've now lifted uh, the height restriction on buildings within the CBD of Joondalup. That is great, because at the moment, really, we don't really have anything beyond three or four storeys. And I think if it's properly designed and developed, it'd be great to see some more medium high-rise buildings, commercial space and the like, uh, being developed in Joondalup, which in turn will allow people to get meaningful employment in Joondalup without having to travel into the city. It means less people on the freeways, and it also means that that in its own right will act as a catalyst for smaller businesses to pop up to support the uh, people who are working in Joondalup. And as such, I'm obviously delighted that the state government has made a commitment to look at decentralising a government department or portion of a government department uh, to Joondalup, and that's certainly a project I'm very much looking forward to. Now, we're also working on the uh, Edgewater multi-storey car park, a $47 million investment, Mr Acting Speaker. Uh, the actual application to the City of Joondalup for development approval has officially gone in. It's a project that is budgeted for, it's going ahead. That will relieve a lot of pressure at that train station at the moment. Uh, Edgewater train station is a popular train station, and if you don't get there early at the moment, your chances of finding a car park are uh, very low indeed. Uh, and finally, can I just uh, thank the Minister of Transport, because the widening of the Mitchell Freeway has made a huge difference already for the residents of the northern suburbs and certainly the residents of Joondalup. That additional lane from Hepburn through to um, right through to um, Joondalup has made a massive difference, and uh, I even benefit from that on a Thursday afternoon when we finish here at five. So. To the people of Joondalup, I just want to take this opportunity to again thank them uh, for the faith that they have entrusted in me, and I look forward to serving them uh, in 2014 and on. Now, Mr Acting Speaker, this is where it gets a tad interesting, because originally uh, this is where my speech would have ended, and in fact it should have ended if it had not have been for the events that I witnessed in this chamber yesterday afternoon. I feel compelled at the end of my speech to lob a hand grenade of reason into this debate. You see, yesterday we had a situation where due to their unprofessional, rowdy, childish and indisciplined behaviour, a significant number of opposition members, the majority of them shadow ministers, were on the verge of being thrown out of this chamber. We had the member for Mira Booker on three strikes. We had the member for Warnborough on three strikes. The member for Kennington and the member for Victoria Park had all been called three times. The member for West Swan twice. The member for Armadale twice. The member for Midland twice. The member for Bassendean twice. And actually, the list just goes on. And all of this, barely two hours, barely two hours in this chamber. This rebelly group even required the Speaker to ask that they do not make snide remarks across the chamber. This type of behaviour we would expect from school children, not members of parliament. This motley bunch opposite is supposedly the alternate government. And this is the type of behaviour they choose to project to the WA public. Is there any wonder, is there Member any wonder that they had such a West drumming? 
handed to them in last year's state election. There's no wonder. If that is how you're going to project uh, yourself as... Uh, member, I caution the member for Warnborough for that comment. And members, I want to hear this in silence. Thank you. Member for Jinla. Thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. I cannot believe that the members opposite are not embarrassed of their own behaviour. Or, or is this truly how you would intend to conduct yourselves as Ministers of the Crown? Is that how you intend to be Minister of the Crown? Because in, in essence, as being a shadow minister, that's what you're aspiring to be. We assume, we, we do assume that members opposite put on a different face when they're in public. But if that is the case, why then do you not act professionally in this chamber? Members on this side of the House take the role of Member of Parliament seriously, and we certainly don't take it for granted. And that is why we are getting on with the job of delivering real outcomes for the people of WA. Let's be frank for a moment. This type of behaviour that was displayed yesterday would not be tolerated for five minutes in the private sector, and I don't even think it would be accepted in the public sector. So why should the standards of a member of parliament be any less? This chamber is not some union rally meeting point. But yet again, yet again, I don't think it is fair to just blame the offenders themselves. As embarrassingly childish as they may be, as with an undisciplined child, eventually you have to look at the parent, or in this case, the leader. The leader of the opposition is the leader of this pack. He, here is a man that was a commissioned officer in the Australian Defence Force. I too served my nation in the Australian Defence Force, but my memories of that time were of discipline, self-control and professionalism. It would seem that the Leader of the Opposition has forgotten these traits rather quickly. Watching members carry on yesterday in the Shakespearean rendition of Monty Python, I wondered why it was that the Leader of the Opposition just sat there. I could conjure up only three possible answers. Either, number one, the Leader of the Opposition endorses, encourages and agrees with the childish and unprofessional behaviour of this shadow cabinet and backbench, or, number two, the Leader of the Opposition doesn't endorse or encourage this behaviour, but he's got no control over his members, i.e. they don't listen to him. Or three, he simply doesn't pay attention to the behaviour of his shadow cabinet and backbench. Now, <laughs> now, actually, no, 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 I actually give the Leader of the Opposition enough credit to not believe options two or three could possibly be the reason. Unfortunately, but, that only leaves us with option number one, which is that the Leader of the Opposition, the man that would like to be Premier, and indeed whose job it is to portray to the people of Western Australia an alternative government is happy to lead a rebelly group of childish and unprofessional members that teeter on the edge of being dismissed from the very chamber from which they would like to lead the state of ours. Let me finish on this. It is well known that the members opposite routinely rely on the hard work of our West Australian journalists and reporters to do their job for them. I guess in some macabre way this should almost be seen as a compliment to our reporters. Time and time again, we see members opposite come in here with a printout of the West Australian or the Sunday Times article, quoting from it, referring to it, indeed relying on it to underpin their very argument. Well, let me reciprocate. In case you were all far too busy conducting a full dress rehearsal of yesterday's theatrics, let me read to you some excerpts from an article in the Sunday Times by Joe Spagnolo. And this is what he had to say about the Labor Party that the Labor Party needs to show the public why Labor can be a credible alternative government. A major criticism I hear of Labor is that it is too negative and that it does not well enough represent as an alternative administration to the Conservatives. You do not do a good enough job there. It goes on to say that since the election we've heard very little about Labor's plan for the future of this state. Now, we have a plan. The Premier outlined his plan on Tuesday. I actually think it's a very, very comprehensive plan. We haven't heard anything from our members opposite even remotely resembling a policy or a vision. Instead, you guys just muck around like school children and almost get thrown out of this place. And Joe Spagnolo finishes off with saying his final advice for you is this. Focus on what you can control and not on what you cannot control. So, Leader of the Opposition, if you were in the chamber, I'd ask you this. My question to you is really quite simple. Can you or can you not control your side of this House? 
Can you portray to the people of Western Australia a credible alternate government? I personally don't think you can. I personally don't think you can. But you know what? Time will tell. Time will tell. My only concern is I'm not quite sure how much time the Leader of the Opposition has left to do so. Thank you, Mr. Acting Speaker.